Welcome back to Tanakh Talk with Tor Talk Weekly Parsha. This week, we've got an exciting Parsha as always. Some call it exciting, some call it not so exciting. I call it Torah. <laughs> and I love it all. So I know you guys do too. Welcome back, Rabbi Mullet. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, indeed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, so Matos Masse, Mas A, Mas I. How do you say that? What's the proper way of saying that? People usually say Masse. Must, must say. So, um, so I know on, on my toast they've got the or my tote, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, the um, it's not a knowing of the vowels, but it's it's the vowel. It is a knowing of the vowels, I guess, right? Or Th- that's that's part of it. Part of it. Okay. And then uh, it was, and the rest of it has to do with. And there's some war stuff. I forget what it was in there now. It's some war stuff, right? Or and war what, what about must a now. Must say is gets its name from the Masay means the travels, the travels of Israel. There's like a log, travel log. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, cool. Different uh, encampments, um, but there's lots of stuff in Masay. It's just there's limited time to cover two parshas, so we'll see what we have a chance to talk about. Gotcha. That's cool. Well, either way, uh, it's exciting. You know what's really interesting is um, years ago, whenever I was uh, when I started studying the Torah, um, the places that used to bore me when I used to be a Christian. Like we, you know, the chronologies and stuff like that. And it's like now, it's like it's all fascinating to me. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe because I'm finding more meaning behind it now than before, and reasons why you should be able to keep track of genealogies, for example. <laughs> so, um, yeah, those are definitely the the hard portions to, yeah. you know, to be too too excited about. It's <laughs> true, but when I look at Masse, for example, and it has forty two. 42 places that the Jews encamped so there is deep there is deep meaning each I mean aside from the history of yeah they literally were in these places but the names aren't arbitrary and each name represents kind of a leg of their spiritual journey as much as their physical journey and the 42 places um, are representative of the 42 letters in God's name, meaning there is a name of God that's spelled with 42 letters. That's Kabbalistic and complicated. There's a 42-letter name, a 52-letter name, a 72-letter name, 26. There's all there's different there's different uh, ways of spelling God's name. So um, I can tell you that if I was going to have a name for myself that I didn't want anybody pronouncing, that's exactly how I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> so there is there is deep significance to these things if you if you look into them deeply. But you know, not saying anyone has to do that, but there's what to find there if you want to look deep. Awesome. All right, well I'll turn it over to you and uh take us away. Yeah. Once again, thank you for having me. Yes sir. Back. Parsha's Matos Masse. A lot of exciting things about Matos Masse. One is the fact that it's two Parshas in one. Um, so, some people have pointed out that in Israel, they were, they've been one Parsha ahead for a while. And that's because um, there's an extra day whenever we have one of the festivals on the calendar. So in outside of the land of Israel, there's an additional ce- day celebrated for technical reasons that I'm not going to do a deep dive on right now. But because what happened was we ended up in the diaspora celebrating the festival for an additional day on Shabbat. So normally we we change the parshas each Shabbos. But because we were still celebrating a festival, we, we, we didn't read that week's parsha. We read the festival reading. Meanwhile, in Israel, they had finished one day early, so they were on a regular Shabbat at the same time, and they read the, the parsha for that Shabbat. So we trailed behind by one week for several weeks, and now they're up to, they read Matos last week in Israel. This week, we're reading Masse. They are reading, they in Israel are reading Masse, and we in the diaspora are combining Matos and Masse, so we finished the same time the book of Numbers. So that's so exciting thing number one, it's two parshas in one. Exciting thing number two, we're catching up with the reading in the land of Israel. And exciting thing number three is that we're finishing the book of Numbers. So what's really nice is for me, and I, I'm grateful to you, William, and to your audience, that now I've been with you more or less for one entire book of the Torah. That's awesome. We started the Parsha series, the last Parsha of uh, the book of Leviticus, but then we continued from Numbers 
till now, till the end, even though I, I, I took one or two breaks in the middle, but um, more or less, yep. we've uh, we've been all the way through. So so uh, the only I'm one very that we missed that. was actually was actually on me uh, because I know uh, you have a great thing set up so that if you don't think you'll make it, you've got a substitute, and that works out great. So the one that one week you had a good substitute set up, and I had to cancel anyway because something came up on my side, and I was like, no. Man, so I'm trying to get it to where we've got these things like like every single one for every every week, every for every year, um, over and over again. You know, like for, uh, I'm gonna keep doing this even. In other words, once we get that full year of you know all the right tour parts, so, uh, I'm gonna keep going, and because next year we will talk about a different aspect of it. You know, right? There's so much that we can't cover in the hour. Yes. The second go around, we can cover more. Right on. So. Uh, right. So now let's get into par- the first of the two, which is Parsha's Matos, and I hope I'll be able to link it to Mase. So it starts out Numbers chapter thirty, verse two. Now it's ve- it's a funny thing because you look at it and you're like, why couldn't it start chapter thirty, verse one? You know, it's like a strange thing to end the previous Parsha with just one verse of chapter thirty. Stop. And start a whole new Parsha on verse 2. Like, either end the chapter one verse later, or start the Parsha one verse earlier. Why Why are we chopping it like that? So, you may be aware, but I don't know how many of your listeners are aware, are aware that the chapter breaks are not Jewish. The chapter right. breaks are, weren't created by the Jews. The verses, you know, big, no, no, let me just explain a little bit. If you look at a Torah scroll, there's no punctuation whatsoever. There's no, like, periods at the end of the sentence. It's just a continuous flow of words, 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 no vowels, no punctuation. And we simply have an oral tradition of how to vowelize the words and where to pause. And not just where to pause, like at the end of each verse, what the punctuation is in the verse, you know, what's kind of the equivalent of a comma, a semicolon, etc. Um, all that is is known orally. And when we read the Torah, we read it with a particular musical cantillation, a musical tune. And the musical tune is the cue for what, where we are in the verse as far as where there's a comma, where there's a semicolon, where there's a period. All that's represented in the musical notes that in the way the Torah is sung. So when I say the, the verse, the breakdown of the verses is Jewish as far as the oral tradition, but then... So we know where the verses start and end, even though it's not punctuated in the Torah. And the Christian Bibles follow that breakdown. However, when you get to the chapters, the chapters were actually divided by Christians. And once that was kind of standardized in print, the Jewish printed Bibles um, incorporated the Christian chapter breaks. More or less, there are some differences. There are some places where we have deviated from the Christian chapter breaks, but um, more or less, for the most part, we adopted the, the the basic structure of the Christian chapter breaks because it, it was a convenient reference. It does become a very convenient reference, certainly when you don't have numbered verses. <laughs> oh, we're in the book of Genesis, verse number 483. <laughs> you know, like, how do I turn to that in the book? So we did adopt the chapters um, just for convenience sake. However, the parshios, the the divisions of the weekly Torah readings, um, are actually a, those are an ancient Jewish invention. So um, because of that, because of that, we didn't move those around to accommodate the Christian uh, chapters. So it just so happened that they divided the chapter one verse before the start of this one. So we start in verse two. It's a little bit strange, but that's just a little rationale why it is that way, you know, it's the Christian's fault. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the, the um, matos, why is it called matos? What does matos mean? Matos is the, is the plural of the word mate. Now, you might be familiar with the word mate in Hebrew because it means a staff. Moshe's staff, the staff of Moses is called his mate. And matos means staves, plural. However, the same word that means staff in Hebrew, mate, also means a branch. And the same word that 
that um, means a staff. There's another word for a staff, which is a shavit. And the word shavit in Hebrew not only means a staff, it also means a tribe. A tribe is a, is a shavit because it's a branch or a staff from the trunk of the tree. It branches off into individual tribes. So the word for tribe, which is shavit, is also the word for a branch or a staff. Similarly, the word mate is typically used for a staff, but could also mean a tribe. Could also mean a tribe. So here in the verse, the opening verse, it says that Moshe is speaking to the heads of the tribes. And here the heads of the tribes are called the Roshe Hamatos, the heads of the tribes. Matos here, the word matos for stabs, branches, is used for tribes here, and that's how the parsha gets its name. And it's very peculiar because it says Moshe speaks to the heads of the tribes of the children of Israel saying, and then he delineates the laws of vows and oaths. And it's the only place we find that Moshe particularly is described as speaking to the heads of the tribes, the laws of vows and oaths. Why not speak the laws of vows and oaths directly to the people like everything else in the Torah? Why specifically to the heads of the tribes? Question number one. Question number two, I'm not really going to stay so formal with the numbering, but another question which comes up is we have two types of two types of pronouncements here which are obligatory on a person in such a way that it's a sin for him to not uphold his word. One of them is called in Hebrew a neder, and another one is called in Hebrew a shivua. Neder, shivua. What's the difference between a neder and a shivua? So in English we have words also. We have what's called vows, and we have what are called oaths. Neder is usually translated as a vow, and a shavua is usually translated as an oath. But if I asked you, William, I'm putting you on the spot, you're in the hot seat. What's the difference between a vow and an oath in English? What what would you say? Okay, so I I was trying to think of something good to say while you were talking about it. And so I could see how um, like if you're standing before the court and they have you put your hand on the Bible, I'm trying to determine, is that a vow for the moment? It almost seems like one is more for like in the moment and one is more like long term, but I don't know. Uh-huh. I, don't, I don't actually know, actually. Interesting. If, that's, if, that's actually not, not bad. Usually we talk about like wedding vows. Okay. But when, we're, when, we, when we testify in court, we're under oath. Yeah, yeah. So one's like in the moment. Well, yeah, that is, that's kind of what I was thinking oath. anyway. Cool. So he's saying like a marriage, like a wedding vow, that's sort of an obligation forever. Right. Whereas an oath is in this moment, I am, uh, I am, uh, what am I doing exactly when right. I'm making an oath? Okay, I cool. am pledging that I'm being truthful, which is right. a funny thing because if I'm not truthful. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what you mean now. Like one, one is saying, I, yeah, yeah, I promise I'm not lying to you. <laughs> and the other so one is like, my, I promise I'll do something. We used to have to take these these exams in high school, and at the, uh, we would we would get to the end of the exam and we had to sign. I hereby affirm that um, you know all my answers are honest and true, and I didn't cheat. You know during this test, right? Got it. That makes and sense. Sign your name at the end, like this affirmation. So my my teacher used to used to laugh at the, it. Was state the, the tests were required by the state, you know? So the state gives us this test. My teacher used to laugh. He's like, you know, because if you cheated on the test, you're certainly not going to lie about it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a funny thing altogether. So I want to talk about what's the difference between a vow and an oath, a neder and a shavua. And legally speaking, and uh, what what's the weight that each one carries? So a neder in the Torah means that I'm obligating myself in something. I'm taking on an obligation. The Torah has, uh, you know, 613 obligations. But for whatever reason, I feel I want to obligate myself in something additional. So here, the Torah seems to give me to give me the ability to do that by making a vow. For example, we have the Nazir. We had the Nazir back in Parsha, Parsha's um, um, Naso, right? The Nazir, the Nazirite, who vows not to drink wine, not to cut his hair, not to come in contact with a dead body. That's one category of vows, is the vow of a Nazir. But a person could, could vow something else, like 
I knew so I knew of someone I should say who took a vow not to eat cake because they were eating so much cake that it was very bad for them. So that, because they couldn't now there's nothing wrong with eating cake in the Torah. Torah doesn't forbid eating cake if it's kosher. So he wasn't breaking a Torah law, but because, except maybe the Torah law that requires us to safeguard our health. But he felt that he needed a specific obligation not to eat cake, and this would save him from binging on cake. So he took a vow, he made a nether, not to eat cake. Okay, now a vow, can ha- we can set a time limit for a vow. I think if we don't set a time limit, it's automatically 30 days. I'm not a legal expert in, in the laws of vows, but from what I recall, a, a vow without setting a time limit is automatically 30 days. But you could you could enunciate um, a, a, a longer or shorter period of time. So um, like I was thinking recently to vow off um, sugar and uh, and white flour because – you know, it's not good for me. And I and I and I have a hard time resisting temptation. So I thought I thought maybe if I make a vow, it would it would be more severe. Why? Once it becomes a vow, it becomes a Torah prohibition because the Torah requires us to keep our vows. Once I make a vow now, it's it's for me, it's the same as eating kosher or not kosher. I would never think of putting something not kosher in my mouth because it's 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 a law of the Torah. And and I and and I and I, you know, I have I have fear of of God not to break his laws. So if I make it a law of God, God says, if you make a vow, you may not break it. And I go and make a vow. Now it's a law of God. So it creates a severity that psychologically is more binding for me and therefore more likely to keep it. So there may be particular reasons a person has to vow off this or vow off the, or to take on a, an obligation. I vow that I will, you know, do X, Y, Z, um, you know, give a certain amount to charity or um, give, you know, help an old lady across the street every day or something like that, that, now, you know, charity is a whole other question in the Torah, what's obligated and what's not obligated. I don't want to go into it. But let's say above and beyond my obligation, whatever that is. You know, I can vow to take on something that I, I have a good reason for doing it, and I just want to kind of make sure that I do it. I can obligate myself with a vow. Is that clear, William? Is that, was that clear, this concept of a vow? Yes, definitely. That was excellent. Okay, so Thank an you. oath, on the other hand, what's called a shavua, an oath is a statement of truth. I am swearing, I'm swearing that what I'm saying is absolutely true. So, so I'm not, I'm not creating an obligation other than the fact that if I say, if I say, and this is just a hypothetical, I'm not actually taking, I'm not actually swearing. But if I say, I swear that I will run on the treadmill every day for a month so what I've done is I've made a statement that, I, that I, I'm affirming is absolutely true. So now it's different than the neder where I, I obligated myself to do it. But here I had better make sure that I get on the treadmill every day for 20 minutes because otherwise I am, I am breaking my oath. So even though the result is the same because in the end I have to get on the treadmill, if I vow to, to – if I vow to do 20 minutes on the treadmill every day versus if I make an oath that I'll do it, the vow obligates me and the oath just says, this is a true statement. Now, I'd better make sure that it's true. So it's two different mechanisms that might end up with the same result, but I'm going to explain a little bit why the severity of one is a little different than the other. Okay, so in other words, I didn't obligate myself to do a thing. I just have to make sure that what I said is true. It's about the truth of the statement more than it's about the obligation. So a wedding vow, right, is I'm obligating myself with with certain obligations towards this person for as long as we're married, right? And uh, and uh, whereas an oath in court is I'm, I'm guaranteeing that what I'm saying is true. So I don't have to make it an obligation. Like uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm swearing that I'm going to go on the treadmill, right? So I have to make sure that's true by going on the treadmill. I could just say, you know, I swear that I saw this person on Wednesday at four o'clock sailing like Washington, you know, whatever it is, I'm, I'm making a statement that I'm affirming is absolutely true. That's not an obligation, but I could also make a statement that's that I, I have to make sure that comes, comes true and ends up being an obligation, but it's not the same as a vow where the vow is the obligation as opposed to, 
this is a true statement, but now I have the burden of making sure that it's true. Otherwise, I said a false, a false oath. And a false oath is very, very severe. More severe, arguably, than a, a vow which I break. And like, I didn't keep my vow. I vowed to go on the treadmill. I didn't, I didn't do it. It has the weight of like, I, I broke a Torah command, like if I were to uh, eat a piece of pork as a Jew, right? That's, not, that's bad. That's bad. It has a certain level of severity. Um, but for example, in court, it would be corporal punishment. I would get lashes for it. Um, I'm not sure that one could get lashes for a neder. I'm not sure. I don't want to say that. But in other words, it would have a similar weight to that in terms of its severity. I would, it's, not capital, it's not a capital crime. Whereas an oath is in Hebrew is the word shavua. Now listen closely. Why is it called a shavua? Uh, uh, um, uh, William, I know that you study some Hebrew. So yes. if I said to you the word shavua, which means an oath in Hebrew, do you know any Hebrew words related to the word shavua? Uh, besides my first, my first thought is Shabbat, actually. Uh, okay. That's, Shabbat is, is like similar, but not, not exactly Shiva directly seven, related. The number seven, maybe. But, oh, the number seven, exactly. Sheva. Okay. Right. The number seven, Sheva, is the root of the word Shavua. Right. Listen, what I'm telling you is deep right now. So what's the connection between an oath and the number seven? That Shavua, oath, is from the root Sheva, meaning seven. Mm-hmm. What's the connection? William, do, can you think of a connection? In seven days of creation, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Seven days of creation. You're on the right track. What do the seven days of creation have to do with an oath? Completion, following through, maybe. Completion, following through. I like that. I like that. I, I won't say that you're wrong. I, it's not where, what I was going to offer as an explanation, okay. but that could, be, that could also be okay. um, one avenue of approach to this. I heard the following explanation, uh, or maybe I read this explanation in one of the writings of Rabbi Victor Miller, a blessed memory, who said it this way. He said that Sheva is the number of creation. It's the number of the seven days of creation. The reason the Torah calls an oath a Shavua is because this is what you are saying when you make an oath. This is the weight of the oath. Mm, wow. I swear that what the words I'm saying now are as true as the fact that God created the world in seven days, or say it differently, that this world that was created in seven days was created by God. I'm putting on the oath the weight of the creation of the world. That, In other words, what's the affirmation of truth? The affirmation of truth is as true as it is that God made a world in seven days, that is the same truth of my statement, which means that if I were to not follow through on my oath, and my oath ends up being false, what have I also falsified? Sorry, that was a question for me, wasn't it? I essentially stated that I deny the, the creator. I see. I deny the creator. In other words, like person says, I swear to God, I swear to God, right? Meaning, I, I, or I, to God, you know, I wouldn't do it, but when a person swears in God's name, what does it mean to swear in God's name? So when God swears, he says, you know, um, he says, Chai Hashem, as God lives, so to speak. It's like, in as much as there is a God that exists, that is how true this statement is. I'm, I am connecting this statement with absolute truth and reality. So in its nature, Rabbi Victor Miller says, every oath is connecting itself to the existence of God as creator. So if we were to say a false oath or not fulfill our oath, we're denying God as creator of the world, which is the worst thing a person could do. So to, to swear falsely or not fulfill an oath that I said, I swear, you know, again, if a person were to say, I swear, I'll get on the treadmill every day for 20 minutes and doesn't do it, so then he's denying God. It's much, much worse than saying, I obligate myself to do this thing, and I didn't fulfill my obligation. That makes sense. Oh, you froze there for a second. Let's see what's happening here. Okay, sit tight. Looks like we lost our connection just for a minute. I'm going to hang up and call him back. Let's call him now. <clears throat>
Oh, he might have lost his connection. Solid. Well, well, well. Well, so far, so good. I'm really learning a lot from the vowels and oaths, though, that's for sure. So... Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that screen alone for a second and see if he will call us back, and so we shall see. But anyway, it's good to see everybody out there. Uh, Andrea, thank you for being here always. Muhammad, welcome. Marcus, Laura, Mordecai, Linda, Janice, Terry Tanner, Valerie, Jeff Johnson, Hope, Rizel. Awesome, good to see you guys. Yeah, I was laughing, Wally, because right before you put that that four dollar cup of coffee in there, just before that maybe two or three minutes ago, I was like yawning like crazy. I couldn't stop. And I'm thinking about doing it again, but I'll get to see. Let me try them again. <clears throat> we'll see if this works. Oh, I need to turn that off. I did that wrong. Right here. All right, we'll give it another shot here and see what happens. So y'all sit tight. Meanwhile, if you have any questions for the rabbi on this for now, uh, put your questions for this week's Parsha um, in the chat box here, and if I can get back in touch with him here, which we might be able to, um, maybe, maybe not, but if we do, we can actually have some questions ready for him. But I know he's got plenty of information to share that'll take up the full hour, but this will be a good way for us to take take advantage of some downtime. <coughs> I'm going to give him just a few more minutes. So y'all sit tight. Don't... Don't hang up. Just sit tight. I'm going to switch over to an ad real fast and try to call him on his phone. I'll be back in just a few minutes. Shalom, my dear friends, followers, and supporters of Tanakh Talk. I would like for you, if you find this channel helpful in any way, and if it has benefited you, please consider supporting Tanakh Talk on a monthly basis. For the first time in eight years, Baruch Hashem, I am now working Tanakh Talk full-time. So having your consistent support is more important now than ever before. The long-term benefits will be excellent. I am finally able to invest the time and energy into the channel that I had intended on in the very beginning, bringing on more shows with more varieties of teachers and more types of classes. The ultimate goal will be to have 12 to 15 shows per week, plus a lot more. Now this is going to take some time, of course, but this is the direction that the channel is certainly headed. Also, I'm having a new website built by donors that's going to be more interactive and useful for everyone. Up until now, YouTube has been my only go-to for most everything to knock talk related, with the exception of the donate button. The new website will completely override the entire website with a slightly different branding curve as well. Same to knock talk, correct spelling. Praise Hashem, with this new website build, the resources will be much easier to locate and utilize. It will also allow me to send out bulk update emails on a fairly regular basis. There's much more to say, but in an effort to keep this video as short as possible, I will end with this. Many of you have been donating for a very long time. Some of you are new. Some of you have been with me since the beginning. That has been very key in keeping this program running for so long. So with all my heart and all my family's heart, thank you so much for your steady support. This is merely the beginning of a long journey, however, and I would be honored to have you all join me along the way. Shalom with lots of love from Tanakh Talk and the Hall family. If you are planning on starting to donate now, just simply go to PayPal and just search for Tanakh Talk by using the email address, tanakhtalk at gmail.com. Patreon is similar, but you can type it in the URL, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tanakh Talk. Thank you again very much for your consideration. So I did get a hold of him. He actually called me before I got a chance to call him. Um, so he said big thunderstorms in our area. He thinks it wiped out the, the internet at his school where he's at. So he's going to try to download on his phone Skype, which shouldn't take but a couple minutes. And, uh, and then he's going to call me back. Uh, well, he just sent me a message. Still having problems downloading Skype even on my phone. Oh, no. Okay. So, hmm. I don't know of anything else. Let me tell him. Rabbi, I, I apologize. I'm only familiar with Skype, unfortunately, period. If you would like, you can record the rest of this later, and I can splice these two together for a future show if you like, period. Maybe try still downloading Skype, but make sure your Wi-Fi is turned off. Oh, yeah. Hold on. I think we got him, guys. I think we got him.
Um, okay, we're back. Yay. All this right. Broadcasting, William? Yes, yes. Now, this is not your phone. This is actually your computer, right? Now on my computer because okay. it's just the internet in the building is, right. went out. And now it's back for as long as it's back. We, we have a heavy thunderstorm here right now. Okay. And I'm at it. It's out of my control. <laughs> You're good to go. You, this is great. I'm glad we hung up. I'm glad we didn't lose connection. And we are ready to keep this baby rolling. So uh, right back where you left off whenever you're ready. Okay. So we, we just de delineated the difference between a, a, a vow and an oath. It's kind of a technical difference, but it's an interesting concept. Um, the, the, there are other details of the, these laws, but I'm not going to go into them now. Now, we asked the question of why, particularly in this area, were the heads of the tribes given the laws of oaths uh, and not the people directly, and not the people directly. So there are a number of different approaches to this, but one of the approaches is that people are discouraged from making oaths and vows. This is 100% true. And as, as much as the Torah gives us this mechanism when it's sort of absolutely necessary, it's discouraged for many, many reasons. Number one, God gave us 613 commandments in the Torah. He tells us don't add to the Torah. Don't take away from the Torah. So here, like I told you, a neder is, it's, it's backed by the power of the Torah that you can't break your neder. You're sort of adding on more obligations, more than the Torah required. And in a certain way, Hashem says, look, my Torah is perfect. What do you think you have to add that it's going to make your life better than the laws I've already given you? So there's a, there's a degree of discouragement for that reason, number one. Number two is that we don't, we don't want people to become flippant with vows. So we don't want it because, again, God didn't make these laws. A person is making a vow because whatever, they're struggling with something and they want to boost their strength in, in doing it by putting more weight on the, on the obligation. But by the same token, the person may not succeed. So in other words, by their own admission, making the vow is an admission that I'm weak in this. I'm weak in this. So then it's very likely then that the person is going to end up breaking their vow. So we don't, we don't want this command to be broken. We don't want vows to be broken. So we don't want vows to be made. So therefore, this was, this was a law which was almost like the ball was hidden. It wasn't publicized. It was spoken only to the leaders and not to the people so that the people shouldn't get the idea that this is some a tool that they should feel is uh, comfortably in their hands to use as they wish. It should be uh, discouraged as much as possible. Another Another level here is... The leaders, it's all related though. The leader, who were the leaders of the tribe? These were the righteous among the people. These were the, the, the wise men among the people. These were the people who understood the laws of vows very, very well and could be trusted the most to be careful with making vows. And also they were the most righteous. So at the same point, they could also be trusted the most to keep their word. But so to speak, the common people, we have more of a suspicion that they are not going to understand the laws of vow properly, uh, laws of vows properly, vow improperly, make improper oaths, um, end up committing severe sins that otherwise, they're very easy to do, you know, you just talk and it's done. So we didn't want to give this heavy, serious, severe power into people that were likely to fail with it. And therefore it was given specifically to the heads of the tribes. Now on that note, on that note, um, on that note, our rabbis teach us that a per, not even though even though the, the the vows and oaths were given to the leaders, leaders of the tribes, it's they apply to everybody. They don't only apply to the leaders; they apply to everybody. But it was this delicate tool, this volatile area that we didn't want it, people to use flippantly. So we gave it to the leaders of the tribes. Now that said. People are allowed to make vows. They are allowed to make oaths. It's very much discouraged, but like we said, under certain circumstances, it can be justified. 
However, there's an exception to that. You know who's not allowed to make a vow and who's not allowed to make an oath? A, a person who does not observe the other commandments of the Torah. We got 613 commandments in the Torah. A guy who's not keeping his basic obligations, a fellow who's not keeping Shabbos, he's not keeping kosher, he's not observing the mitzvahs that the Torah requires on him. He may not make a vow. He may not take an oath. You know why? Because if already he's obligated from Sinai in these laws and he doesn't keep them, the law that he obligates himself he's going to keep, the laws of God he doesn't keep, his own law that he pronounces he's going to keep, this is exactly analogous to signing at the end of the test that my teacher used to make fun of. Certainly the guy who cheated on the test isn't going to lie about it at the end. He's cheating the whole way through the test. He cares to lie about it at the end? Of course not. So the guy who's, who's not observing the Torah mitzvahs in an open way, brazenly and blatantly uh, abrogates the laws of the Torah, cannot make a vow. He's forbidden from making a vow because there's no, there's no, he has no, um, what's the word, like accountability. He has no, uh, I can't think of the word that like, um, like, like trust. There's no, there's no way to trust him with it. So he's not allowed to do it. So this topic, I want to connect to something that comes up in Parsha's Mase. So now we can connect the two together in a clever way. That is, and that is as follows. A, why is it that a person who can't, who doesn't follow the Torah can't keep a vow? Because a, a, because a person who doesn't have the willpower, the strength to follow the Torah's laws, he's not considered a free person. He doesn't have his own volition because he's a total slave to his desires. This is a person who's a slave to his evil inclination. Everything his evil inclination tempts him to do, he does. He's a, totally a slave to his evil inclination, and he has no willpower to defy his evil inclination. So certainly that's true also of the, of the, of the vows. Now, when we were given the Torah, when we were given the Torah, it says the Torah is described as charus al haluchos, that the words of the Torah were charus. In Hebrew, this means they were engraved on the luchos, on the tablets. The words are engraved on the tablets. But our rabbis tell us that since the word's not vowelized, charus, it could be read an, an alternate way. And the alternate way to read it, the word charus, which has no vowels, is, is to vowelize, vowelize it as the word charus. Cheros means freedom. Cheros means freedom. Freedom on the tablets. That when the Torah was given to, to the Jewish people, they were given freedom. And the same goes for all of mankind as far as the laws of, of the Bnei Noach. When God gives us laws, he actually sets us free. And people think, what do you mean? I'm obligated by these laws. I'm a slave. I'm a prisoner. It's just the opposite, because when a person denies the Torah, what does he do? He goes and he follows all his temptations. And in other words, a guy who says, I just, I said it about myself, right? I can't stop eating sugar. I can't stop eating white flour. I can't schlep myself onto the treadmill. I just, I'm too lazy. I know I need to go on the treadmill. And I'm like, ah, it's too hard for me, right? That's my evil inclination saying, don't go on the treadmill. Do you want to sweat? Do you want to? Uh, you want to make have a hard time? Eat the thing that tastes good. Eat. Don't worry about your health. Your health, eh? Right? I'm a slave to. I just can't get over it. I can't break free. So when the Torah gives us laws and says, "Don't eat this. Don't work on the Sabbath. Do wear this. Don't wear that," and all the various laws, do marry this person, not that person. These relations are permitted. These relations are forbidden. Don't steal. Don't covet, etc and we follow those, we've been set free from the shackles of the, of the animal that is the human. In other words, at, 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 a, at a very basic form, you know, we're born, we're born just basically an animal. We're just a body with, with, with bodily desires. And some people could grow up and never outgrow being an animal and always chase after their desires and never put any limits on themselves and destroy themselves in the process. But it's only our humanity it's only our, our, our divinity, our, our the, 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 the spark, the image of God that's imbued within us that allows us to overcome our animal instincts. 
That is the Torah. The Torah frees us from the shackles of our base desires, which schlep us everywhere we go. The Torah is freedom. The Torah is freedom. The words are engraved on the tablets. The words were freedom on the tablets. The giving of the Torah was the freedom of mankind. Now, if we go to Parshas Masse, listen to this, okay? We go to Parshas Masse, which I said is the travels of the Jews through the desert. So what happens when the Jews travel through the desert? It gives the names of all the places. So when they left Egypt, when they left slavery, slavery in Egypt, right? Real physical slavery that they left. Where did they go? It starts to talk about the places that they encamped. And one of, the, one of the places that they went very close to Egypt was a place called Pihachiros. Now I'm looking for the verse, which I put in my notes for the class. Pihachiros, for some reason, it seems like maybe I forgot to put it in my notes. They encamped in a place called Pihachiros. Now Pihachiros, the word P in Hebrew means mouth of. The mouth of Chiros. Now, Chiros, once again, is the same letters as the word Chiros, freedom. The mouth of freedom. The place where they encamped was a place called the mouth of freedom. Now, William, if I asked you, you with me? Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. Is anyone so me? I, was I don't looking, know. I, maybe my internet went out again. I was looking so. for your – I see something in Exodus 14.2 on Pihachi. Right? It is in Exodus, but it's also here in Numbers in Masse when it lists the places. Oh, gotcha. Okay. It talks about going to Pihachi Rose. I'm trying to find it in my notes. I thought I put it in my Let notes. See. I'm not, I'm not uh, able to find it here. I, you know, I don't have the citation off the top of my head. It's okay. But uh, anyway, they go to – oh, yeah, it's 33.6. Numbers 33.6. Sweet. They go to Pihachiros. Now, Pihachiros, again, means mouth of freedom. Okay. Why, do you suppose, why do you suppose that there was a place, that there was a place basically on the outskirts of Egypt called the mouth of freedom? Why would you suppose that? That's like a big exit sign. Because <laughs> it seems like Egypt was the place of slavery. So Pihachiros, yeah. it's the mouth of freedom. This is the opening wow. to get free. That's what you would think, right? That's what you would think. But... Um, it says, Piachiros, Pier Lifne Baal Tsephon. That Piachiros was in front of a place called Baal Tsephon. Now, Baal Tsephon was an idol. Baal Tsephon was an idol. And our sages tell us that Baal Tsephon, the idol Baal Tsephon, where Piachiros was, was this place of idolatry in front of a, there must have been a big idol there, a big statue of Baal Tsephon. Our sages tell us that Baal Tsephon is the same idol that the Torah calls Baal Peor, which we had in Parshas Balak at the end when the Jews were sinning with the daughters of Moab and the daughters of Midian. The Jews sinned and they worshipped an idol called Baal Peor. And that and the plague and the plague occurred, right? right? What was the worship of Baal Peor? How was Baal Peor worshipped? Do you know do you know William how Baal Peor was worshipped? Um all I know, all I remember is the um, – in part of the Midrash, they had spoken about how to convince how to trick the, the Jewish people into bowing was they would put whatever it is above a low-rising door so they would have to stoop underneath and things like that. So that's the only memory recollection I have offhand. Okay. So while bowing is a somewhat universal form of worship, Baal Peor had a particular form of worship that was unique to this idol. And the unique form of worship of Baal Peor – was that a person was meant to urinate oh, wow. and defecate. You'll have to excuse me for saying this. Sure. Uricate, urinate and defecate on the idol. Oh, wow. And this was considered honoring the idol. This was worshiping the idol. So, so, um, so could you imagine, right? It's the lowest, most disgusting, most undignified act you could imagine. And this was venerated by the cult of Baal Peor as the highest form of honoring the idol. To the point said that the Jews who were ignorant of this worship, who wanted to um, deface the idol, to show disdain for the idol, it says there was a certain Jew who ate like a lot of prunes, okay? Oh, wow. He had a lot of laxative foods and he caused himself to empty his bowels in a very disgusting way on the idol. 
and he starts saying to the idolaters, look what I did to, to your idol, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, what you did to the idol, that was, you, we couldn't have done it better. Right. You, you're our teacher. We, we should, no one has worshipped it as good as you worshipped it. Wow. So Baal Pa'or or Baal Tzaphon was worshipped by the lowest, most depraved act. And this was, and this was elevated as the greatest of the great. Why? Why would anyone do this? Why would anyone do this? So listen to the, to the insight of our sages. Because once you debase yourself, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. I, when I was in high school, we had a speaker come to the high school. It was a, a, a former soldier who was in the all-black uh, um, soldiers um, platoon of, of the, uh, in World War II. When, when white soldiers and black soldiers were unfortunately segregated in the U.S. Army. So there was a, there was a black group of soldiers that um, liberated one of the concentration camps. And one of these soldiers came and he spoke to us in our school and he told us about his experience in the war and, and, and liberating the Jews from the concentration camps. And he said that he saw people who were like walking skeletons, walking skeletons. They had no meat on their bodies. They were just skin and bones, and they were walking, barely walking. And he said he saw these people squat on the ground and defecate right in front of the soldiers. And he said to himself when he saw this, he says, he was thinking to himself, where's your dignity? Where's your dignity? He was thinking to himself when he saw one of these starved, emaciated Jews defecating on the ground. And then he thought, his second thought was, dignity? Dignity? This person is just trying to stay alive. He's just trying to stay alive. That's, that's where he's at. He can't think about dignity, right? He's just trying to stay alive. But in other words, the last place of like losing your dignity is, you know, when you're willing to just defecate publicly. And that's going on in some of our cities, unfortunately. So they, they venerated, they put up on a pedestal the most undignified physical act and said, this is our worship. This is our highest value. Why? Because once a person throws off his basic ingrained dignity that every normal person would, would have most basic, once he throws that away and he says, even this I'm willing to do, then there's no sin he won't do. There's no sin he won't do and there's no act that he won't venerate as the greatest of acts, no matter how low, depraved, and disgusting it is. Baal Pa'or was freedom. Pihachiros meant, this is the mouth of freedom. Freedom from all inhibition. Freedom from all morality. Freedom from all shackles of decency. Freedom from all obligation. Because if you're willing to defecate it on an idol and say, this is my highest value, there's nothing that you won't feel that is beneath you to do. And you will commit the most depraved acts and you'll venerate those acts. And I tell you, William, and your listeners today, does this not sound like exactly what's going on in our society today? Right. Where the most depraved and deviant acts are held up on a pedestal as the greatest, most heroic thing a human can do. They, 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 they stamp it with the word pride. Oh, yes. Pride. Right. right. You have to have pride yep. for these kinds of acts. Dra what was it? Drag your kids to uh, whatever. They do drag shows in front of children. And they say pride. It's not just a thing we do. We put it on a pedestal. We put our children in front of it. We show them this is our value. This is our pride. They they say, shout your abortion. Now, I don't know where you stand on abortion, anyone who's listening. And in halacha, it's complicated. In Jewish law, it's complicated. It's not cut and dry. It's not black and right. white that abortion is totally forbidden. It's certainly not encouraged. And it's certainly not something that could be always permitted or easily permitted, although there are halachic um, situations where it would be permitted or obligatory, generally when it involves danger to the mother, um, either either psychological or physical. Uh, it also would depend on the stage of the pregnancy, etc. But be that as it may, we all can agree, we should all agree, 
It doesn't matter who you are, where you come. We should all agree that a human life is precious. A human life is precious, whether it's in utero or out. A human life is precious, and there might be circumstances where even the Torah would allow a termination, but it's a tragedy. When that has to happen, it's only under the most extreme duress and tragedy. We have to admit that. But now it's 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 shout your abortion, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, how does a society go to, it's because this is our ideal of freedom. Freedom is freedom from all, but what it truly is, though, is what it truly is, is it's slavery. So the, the, what they call freedom is really slavery, meaning it's slaves to all my basest urges. I, I, I don't draw any limit of where I'm going to lift myself and my own dignity and my own humanity among, above any act. And where will it end? Infanticide, bestiality, murder, you name it, there'll always be some justification. We ha there has to be a line drawn. So Pihachiros, this was the mouth of freedom, meaning where is it, how is that we could free ourselves of all of our natural inhibitions and human decency? Here, go defecate on the idol. If you could do that, if you could do that, you could do anything. So that was Pihachiros, the mouth of freedom. However, the mouth of freedom leading in which direction? In which direction? This wasn't the mouth of freedom lead, leading out of Egypt. This was the mouth of freedom leading, leaving in. Mm. It wasn't the exit sign to Egypt. It was the entry sign. Oh, wow. Come to our society. Come to Egypt where you could be free, where you could be depraved, where you could be low, where you could be immoral, where anything you do will venerate and say, it's good, it's good, it's good. You should have pride. You should have pride. Shout about your disgusting depravity. Shout about it. So so it was, it was the entryway in, not the entryway out. So my proof for this, my proof for this is that it says when the Jews left that place, the name changes. Suddenly in the next verse... When they leave that place, it's no longer called Pihachiros, the mouth of freedom. It's called Penehachiros, the face of freedom. So how did we get from the mouth to the face? Here's why. Because if the, if the mouth is the opening and you're going, you go, right? The mouth is, come on in, ah, 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 come on in, right? So if you go through the mouth, you end up, you end up in, in, the, in the throat, right? You end up inside you you end up in this closed dark space but if you go out if you go out then where are you you're opposite the face so the jews were going away from egypt so they went from the mouth to the face they were getting out of this place they were getting away from the place of depravity the pr place of nolus lo lowness so they went from the mouth to the face from here they went outward where now they're exposed to the to the whole face. But if you go, if you would enter the Piachiros, if you'd come in the entry sign, right? That would say, this is where you're free to Egypt. You you would be deep inside. So so um, Peor was the name of the idol, and it's the same letters as Pharaoh. They were going to if you went through the Piachiros, the place of the worship of Peor through the mouth, you would be entering into the place of Pharaoh. Peor and Pharaoh is the same letters and also um the same letters as oref and oref means the back of the neck because you're going this way you're going backwards you're going to the back and that's in fact where the 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 service of this idol took place in the back in the back of the person so they the piha heroes they they left the place of depravity they just, and where did they go they went to sinai where you would say no they got their obligations they became slaves to god as it were we say no the, when the when the Torah was given, it was charus al haluchos engraved on the tablets charus al haluchos. That's the true freedom. When you can follow the Torah, when you can follow the Torah, so then you free yourself from your base desires. the The Torah gives us freedom from our evil inclination. But when we go back from where we came from, from Egypt, and we head through that opening. The piacher is the, the so-called mouth of freedom that they're offering. That's freedom from all inhibition. That's total depravity. Total depravity. So why am I saying that? Because here, if a guy can't keep the Torah, we don't allow him to take vows. I'm bringing it back to the vows now. Back from Masse, let's go back to Matos. The the vows. We can't let if you if you're if you don't have the freedom to keep the Torah, if you're not holding by that freedom, the charus, the cherus, 
the freedom of the Torah, that you're not free from your evil inclination and you can't observe the Torah, well, then certainly we can't allow you to take a vow because as much as you're a slave to your inclination, you're not going to be any less of a slave when you, when you make the rules for yourself. So therefore, the laws and vows are given to the heads of the tribes. Okay. Um, well, again, why the heads of the tribes? Because those were the righteous people that could be trusted with vows. But the common people, we had to be much more discerning. And with someone who is not even Torah observant, vows are completely off limits. So we don't place the vows in front of everyone as a free-for-all. Whoever wants to vow could vow. Absolutely not. So we, we entrust it only to the righteous who are um, in the head of the nation. At least, again, that's the way it's phrased in the Torah. When the laws of vows are given, is they're given by Moshe to the leaders because that's essentially where it belongs. Um, next, okay, we have four minutes left. I wanted to, ooh, there's so much, and it's so hard to, so hard to. <laughs> pick and choose. <laughs> it's so hard to pick and choose in the last few minutes what I'm, what I'm going to talk about. So, so maybe I'll talk about one thing that I, I find to be very powerful, okay? Sounds good. Uh, we'll go to the war with Midian. So God commands the Jews to go to war with Midian in this language. Nikom nikmas b'nei Yisrael. Take, take the vengeance of the children of Israel, me'isa Midianim, from the Midianites. Avenge the vengeance of Israel against the Midianites. That's what God says to Moshe. Avenge the vengeance of the children of Israel against the Midianites. Because the Midianites caused them to sin. There was a plague. 24,000 people died. And God says, avenge them. Avenge, uh, go, avenge the Jewish people. So already the first question you're asking is, doesn't the Torah say don't take revenge? Now, move on. The next verse, Moshe, this is in uh, Numbers chapter 31, verses 2 and 3. So Moshe turns to the people and he says, everyone, prepare yourselves for war. And we're going to fight against Midian to take God's vengeance against Midian. Nikmas Hashem, Moshe says, God's vengeance. God says to Moshe, take the vengeance of the Jewish people. And Moshe says, let's take God's vengeance. Look how interesting it switches. Was it the vengeance of the Jewish people or is it God's vengeance? So the well, number one thing to see is where's God's concerned? He's concerned about himself. Take vengeance for me. Take vengeance for me. No, God's not concerned about his. He doesn't take vengeance for himself. But he says, they did something bad to you, the Jewish people. I can't, I can't abide that. The vengeance of the Jewish people, that I command you to take. Moshe turns to the people and says, let's take our vengeance. It's about us. We have to take vengeance. No. He says, God's vengeance, you know how upset God is right now? We have to do this for God. God's doing it for us. We're doing it for him. Look at that relationship. Look at that love. God's totally selfless. He says, Jews, they did something wrong to you. It has to be avenged. And Moshe's like, Hashem's upset. We have to do it for Hashem, not for us. No one's looking out for themselves. They're always looking out for the other. That's beautiful thing, number one. But number two, is it God's revenge or is it the Jews' revenge? So the answer is it's both. When, and this is something that God states in Zechariah, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 12. God says to, Ze to Zechariah, he says, the one who touches you, he's talking about the enemy of the Jewish nation, the enemies who, 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 uh, who um, fought against the Jewish nation and exiled them and destroyed you know, the Babylonians. He says, the one who touches you, he is touching the pupil of God's eye. When someone touches you, he's like he's sticking his finger into God's eye. God's not going to react. When someone touches the Jewish people... God says, you're sticking your finger in my eye. Is it possible, is anyone here, is it possible that something should stick into your eye and you don't react? It's our most basic reflexes is, you know, like you flinch, something goes towards your eye, you blink right away. You can't, you can't touch the eye without a reaction. God says, someone touches the Jews, they're touching the pupil of my eye. You, the Jewish people, are the pupil of my eye. So, the, so when Midian did something to the Jews... They touch God, the people of God's eyes. So the vengeance of the Jews is the vengeance of God. So really they are the same. Now, now, furthermore, the question of what about, what doesn't it say don't take revenge? So what it really says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, is it says, don't 
take revenge and don't hold a grudge as b'nei amecha with those of your nation. A Jew is not allowed to take revenge against another Jew. That's off limits. And in the same verse it says, and a lot of people don't realize this, that's the first half of the verse. What's the second half of the verse? Does anybody know? It's so famous, but we usually only quote the second half alone or the first half alone. We don't put these together. It says, don't take revenge and don't hold a grudge against members of your nation. And you shall love your fellow as yourself. And the end of the verse says, Ani Hashem, I am God. Nice. And the and the the commentaries explain, uh, uh, you know, again, how could you take revenge against a Jew? You have to love your fellow Jew like you love yourself. Ani Hashem, I'm God. You're my people. I love you. I love the other Jews like I love you. So how could you go and take revenge against another Jew? That's like doing something against me, right? So the, 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 the prohibition of vengeance is specifically between one Jew and another. But another thing to learn over here, another thing you have to learn over here, listen carefully. I'm not saying, oh, okay, so now I could go take vengeance against anyone I want if he's not Jewish, right? No. God doesn't tell us to be mavericks. We're not supposed to be mavericks because we, we are not true judges like God is. And we may feel wronged and we may feel upset. But you know what? Maybe we're in the wrong. Maybe we're in the wrong. Maybe what happened to us was God's will that it should happen to us and we should let it be. Right. We're not in a position that we could judge to say this is what he deserved. He did something to me, so I'm going to do something back to him. How do you know that's what he deserves? God told you that's what he deserved. No, we can't be mavericks. We can't take the law into our own hands. Let God handle the revenge. So when he says over here, Jews, take revenge, we do it because God said so. Not we didn't go do it before. If God didn't say go take revenge from the Midianites, we weren't revving up to do it. We weren't. Absolutely not. And there's a lot more to say. And I know I'm over time, but William, we lost some time. Can I can I make up a few last absolutely, minutes? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. It's very, very deep what I'm what I want to share. So so you don't take revenge ever, because we can't take the law into our own hands. We're not the judge. Let God be the judge. If it's in a court of law following the laws that God gave us how to judge, that's what God said. This is how you judge. Revenge is off limits because we're not the judge. However, God, who is the absolute judge, if he knows this is the punishment that is deserved by this party, he's the one who can do it. And how do we know? Because it says in Psalms, I've got some more thunder and lightning. I hope you're still with me. It says in Psalms, chapter 94, verse 1, El Nekamos Hashem. God is a God of vengeance. Hashem is a God of vengeance. God is a God of vengeance. God is a God of vengeance. You hear this? So, and this is such a poignant verse that the rabbis point out. Look, they say, look how great vengeance must be. Because two names of God are on either side of it. Right? El, it's one name of God. Nekamos, vengeance. And then the name Hashem. God, vengeance, Hashem. Hashem is a God of vengeance. Look how God surrounded the word of vengeance with his, with his names. With It's very important. What's the analogy? The analogy is, I heard from Rabbi Vigner Miller, again, blessed memory. He said, if you see a guy walking down the street and on his right side is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the head of the Lubavitch movement, and on the other side is the Sat Merav, the head of the Satmer Chassidim, these two great Hasidic dynasties, the heads of each, are walking on either side of some anonymous fellow in between. You better believe that guy's important. If the, if the Satmar Rebbe is going to walk on one side and the Lubavitcher Rebbe is going to walk on the other side and he walks in between the two of them, you better believe he's an important guy. So if God put one name on one side and one name on the other and vengeance in between, you better believe that that's, that's a, a, an important thing. Because vengeance, when it's vengeance of God, is justice. And justice is very foundational. So Kehlendo comes to Shem, God is the God of justice, but that's when God does it. We are not the arbiters of justice. So vengeance is off limits for us. Now, I want to just um, expand in the next couple of minutes a little bit more. When God says that Israel is the, is the pupil of his eye, and when someone touches Israel, he touches God, and the vengeance of Israel is the vengeance of God. Okay, We see this everywhere in the Tanakh. In Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, what does God say? He says, he says, go tell Pharaoh, 
Israel is my firstborn son. And since you don't let him go, if you don't let him go, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. You're going to mess with my firstborn son? I'm going to mess with your firstborn son. You don't mess with my firstborn son, says God. Now, what I really want to go with this is, what I really want to show, what I want to bring out from this for the, the general audience, you're going to say, Israel, 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 is that let's, let's, let's expand Israel to be those who are righteous in the eyes of God, the righteous among the nations together with the nation of Israel. And understand that Hashem says, when you, when you suffer, I suffer. Your suffering is my suffering. What parent doesn't feel pain when their child feels pain? This is what God is revealing. That's my firstborn son. That's my firstborn son. Yep. You touch him, you're touching my eye. So in Psalms chapter 91, verse 15, it says, Imo anochi batzara, I am with him in pain. When he is in pain, I am in pain. God is with us in our pain. That's the idea of God's revenge is Israel's revenge because the pain of Israel is the pain of God. My pain is God's pain. Your pain is God's pain. When you're in pain, God is feeling your pain with you. God is the ultimate empathic, individ empathetic individual. When you are in pain, he, are, he is in pain. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 9. In all of his pain, God has pain. It says over there. In Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20, it says... When he's talking about the Jews going into exile, he says, as you go into exile, I want you to place place markers along the road so that you'll know how to return. And when he describes the road, he says, the road that you have walked, the road that you have walked in Jeremiah 31, 20. In Hebrew, it's spelled differently than it's pronounced. Even though it's pronounced halacht, which means the way that you walked, it's spelled with a silent yud at the end, which means if you would pronounce the yud, the word would be halachti, which means I walked. Mm -hmm. Even though the word is pronounced halacht, you walked, it's written as though it says halachti, I walked. Because God's saying, when you went out to exile, I went with you into exile. And in the Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Iti mi kala, with me, from Lebanon, O bride, which Rashi said, the commentators say, it means that when you left Lebanon, now Lebanon is a metaphor for the temple, which was made of cedars, cedar wood from Lebanon, but also whitened the sins of Israel, which is the word Lavan in Hebrew, means white. So Le Lebanon means the place of whiteness, whitening sins, which was the temple where the sacrifices and aton atonements were offered. He says, when you leave the temple, O bride, when the temple is destroyed and you go into exile, E.T., it's with me. Iti me Lebanon kala. With me, O bride, you go from Lebanon. And the next words are, Iti me Lebanon tavoi. And you will come with me from Lebanon. What does it mean? You will go, you will come. When you return, you will also return with me. Which means, the commentators say that God goes with us into exile. And he remains with us in exile in all our pain. And he returns with us. And the Nefesh HaChaim therefore says, one of the great books of Jewish philosophy, says an incredible thing. Listen to where I'm going with this. He says, if you want your prayers to be answered, one way is to say, you know, God, I only want what you want. And I want my prayers to be in conformity with yours. And construct our prayers in a way that we know we are asking for what will fulfill God's will, but even on its most basic level, says the Nefesh Chaim, we're praying, we think we're being selfish. We're being, God, I need this, God, I need that. Please help me with this, help me with that. I'm suffering in this way, I'm suffering in that way. That's very selfish. How is such a prayer supposed to work? So says the Nefesh Chaim, you have to know that when you're suffering, God is suffering. You're his creation. You're his child. When you're in pain and he's a father, a merciful father. He's in pain with you. He's in pain with you. The, the, the commentators say, why did God appear in a bush? When, when the fire, the angel goes into a bush and appears as a fire in a burning bush. It was a thorn bush. Why did the angel go into a thorn bush and appear as a fire? So the commentators say, because God said, right now the Jews are in a thorn bush. They're in Egypt being suffered, making to suffer from all sides. They're being pricked and poked and whipped and hurt and hit 
and injured from all sides like someone caught in a thorn bush. So God says, I'm also in the thorn. I put myself into the thorn bush. I'm in the thorn bush. When you're suffering, I'm suffering. So the Nefesh Chaim says, when we suffer and we're asking God to alleviate our suffering, says, God, I don't, I don't want you to alleviate my suffering. I want you to alleviate your suffering. I know that it's, it, it, it hurts you when I'm in pain. So please, not for my sake, for your sake, Hashem, I don't want you to be in pain. I don't want you to be in pain. So please alleviate my pain so your pain can be alleviated. Th to that degree is, is God one and with us in all of our experiences, including and especially our experiences of pain. I'm going to end with a story. Can I end with a story, William? Yes, sir. I heard this parable a long time ago. I find it extremely moving. It's a parable, obvious, obvious parable, but the, the story goes that this person, he goes through life and he suffers terribly. He goes through many, many difficult chapters and many, many difficult trials. And, and all the while he's wondering, you know, where is God? Eventually, after 120 years, he dies and he goes up and he meets God. And God says, I want to show you the path that you walked in life. And he shows him this path and the path represents his life and each stage on the path is a different chapter of his life and he's looking and he's seeing all the things that he went through the good and the bad the, the the hard and the pleasant and along the path he sees not one set of footprints but two sets of footprints walking the path and he says god why are there two sets of footprints on my path of life and god says because everywhere you went i went with you and he looks more carefully and he sees that specifically during the hardest parts of his life, there's only one set of footprints over there. Only one, not two. So he looks to God and he says, look, when I went through hardship, when I went through pain, when I went through suffering, you abandoned me. You abandoned me. Why? Why did you abandon me? God says, why would you think I abandoned you? He said, look, there's only one set of footprints. I was alone. I was alone. You weren't with me. And God says, you think those are your footprints? Those aren't your footprints. Those are my footprints. Yeah. And the first fellow says, your footprints? Where was I? He said, when you were going through your hardest struggles, I carried you on my back. Mm -hmm. I carried you on my back. And that's why. That's why you don't see your footprints over there, because I was carrying you on my back. And we all have to know that, and we all have to feel it, and we all have to understand that God says, you, when, when, when someone or something touches you, 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 those who are my children, those who are attached to me, says, that pain is my pain. I'm with you always. And that's a very, very powerful lesson I think we learn from from these verses in 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 the Parsha when he's when God says, take the vengeance of the Jewish people, and Moshe says, We're taking God's vengeance, because these are one and the same. God is with us in our pain. He's with you and he's with me through every stage of our life. Sometimes he walks alongside us and sometimes he carries us on his back. But we always need to know Hashem is with us. And I hope you could all walk away with that feeling. And thank you for bearing with me an extra few minutes. William? You betcha. Back to you. Great job. Great job. Thank you all for tuning in. Rabbi, it's been an awesome, awesome part as usual. A uh, lot more. The best thing about you dabbling in this into different highlights, it, it's like, okay, now we have to wait a year to get the rest of the story <laughs> or more about the story. So that's the beauty of studying Torah, though, on a, on a yearly basis, you know what I mean, year after year after year. So so it's a beautiful thing. So, But, again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn on notifications, and share these videos with your friends. This is really great. Um, this is one thing that I used to long for, looking for the, the weekly Parsha of the week. It's like watching a football game live is so much more exciting than watching a replay. So this is like the live tour Parsha, Parsha sort of. That's kind of how I look at it anyway. So but anyway, all that said, you guys have a wonderful week, and we will see you uh, in about – see the rest of you viewers who are interested in about 45 minutes for uh, a little Hebrew lesson coming up to you shortly. So don't go anywhere. See you later, guys. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.